All right, I'm on. Well, uh, thanks to Mark for, uh, I wasn't sure if you were going to share the story of the triumphal entry or not, but so we can skip that part of the notes at the beginning, so I appreciate that. That's not real, you know, I mean, that, that's, you could chalk that one up to coincidence. It's, you know, Palm Sunday, so, you know, he shares it, I share. You, you can't read into too much of that, but, oh man, there's some other things here today that, uh, that uh, oof, you could read into. The second thing I got to do before I start is uh, I got to put a little disclaimer for anybody watching at home and, you know, you hear that don't see any scripture on the screen. That's totally my fault. Um, I was uh, tardy to the party. Uh, and so uh, that did not happen. Uh, and so I will be reading them. I encourage you to get your word out, look it up, write down the references. I'll try to make sure those all get to you so you can fact check everything uh, later. So, all right. Behold, he comes. That's the title of our sermon today. Um, and so uh, I did get it to the bulletin, by the way. How many of you are surprised to see me standing here after you looked at the bulletin? It is in the bulletin, so I, I, progress, right? Thank you, Rhonda. All right, sorry. All right, so we are going to uh, touch base on the triumphal entry. We're going to start there, uh, but then we're going to end up in a couple uh, of other different places. So, um, you know, Mark already read that story for you, so I'm not going to reread it, and, but just be, begin to uh, you know, commentate on it a little bit, and then uh, we're going to go to another place uh, in Revelation, actually, not uh, seven, I think you read, but another one. So, you know, the triumphal entry, here he comes, right? Uh, they want him, they being the people, the Jews, they want him to reestablish the throne of David, right? To set them free from the oppression of, the, of their earthly oppressors. Oh, how we can relate, right? So earthly focused are they, so us-minded, this is our great challenge now, isn't it? To fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. To set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. So of course, we now know this triumphal entry wasn't about a physical or earthly kingdom not even one as significant as the nation of God's chosen people. He comes on a colt of a donkey to the daughter of Zion, a biblical Hebrew reference to Jerusalem in fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy, as Mark has already mentioned. Yet another earthly clue, but it's meant to point us heavenward. As I was meditating on this passage over these past two weeks, and especially this past week, in praying about what to share, it, stu it struck me how much this story reminds me of another story. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation 19. When I was a kid, a teenager, I had this poster uh, that hung in my room, and it was of this man on a white horse. And it had these scripture references, and it was just awesome. And so uh, I've always thought about that, and today I'm going to read the text that, that comes from here in Revelation 19, John's Revelation, you know, that came 60, 30 to 60 years later, 66 AD, I think is the uh, ascribed time of it, which is some 30 years later, Jesus had come, he'd gone, the persecution was rampant. And so in Revelation 19, John says this, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So such similarities, isn't there? 
And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and the riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of his mouth, out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on the flesh. What a scene. I mean, a little graphic. If there's any young kids in here, sorry. But... Here's the reality of the world we live in. And here's my confession. If I'm not careful, this doesn't mean so much to me. It doesn't excite me as it should. Maybe it's because when I leave here today, I'll drive home to my cozy suburban home in the United States of America with my beautiful wife and my four healthy babies. I'll be at peace with God. I'm secure in my position as his son. I'm living with purpose in my life as an ambassador of his kingdom. And that's great, you may say. But if I am honest, I'm not necessarily in a hurry for him to return. Not necessarily because I'm afraid to die, but rather because I experience his presence now. The kingdom has come near to me. The truth is, I don't really know what I'm missing either. I have not experienced the fullness of heaven. So I do not really know what my eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I do try to imagine it though occasionally, Just the other day, last week, I mentioned to Mark how I wish we had more time together, how in heaven, I look forward to the times when he and I can just take off on a three-day hike, just going about the kingdom and seeing all its beauty. We'll have no guilt of what we're, our responsibilities, no worry of what we're missing, no mission that we only have a little bit of time for. And we'll come back and it'll, it'll have been like a few minutes. And we'll have fellowshiped and laughed and enjoyed each other's presence. I had the same conversation a few days later with Curtis. Hmm. You try to taste and imagine what it's going to be like. And then two things happened shortly after. As I was preparing, I began thinking about this movie we're going to see Uh, tomorrow and all the other kinds of mass evil in the world and I started making a list before I went to bed that night I was a bit discouraged when I get my eyes off of my own life and I look around and I realize that everyone isn't experiencing the same joy and the same peace in the kingdom of God like I am. And so I had, that, I had a dream that night. It's not the first dream I've had that I felt like uh, was from God, but it's the first I've had while preparing a sermon. And so uh, I want to share it with you. Mark and I were out for a little hike and we were coming along the river, and across the way, we, we thought we saw a deer. We're like, oh, look at that buck over there. And as we got closer, it was weird. It was a goat, actually, with a little beard. And so, <laughs> listen, I'm not going to give you the interpretation fully and explain it all. There is. So we continued up around the hill, and there was this, this feeling of joy, you know. But a moment came, and I turned around. And out of nowhere, over the cliff, showed a lion, a large lion, a male lion. And he jumped across, and he was behind Mark. 
and I didn't know what to do. I had something in my hand and I threw it and it distracted it for a second. Should I get his attention? Should I tell him to run? It's a lion. And so we were coming up on a wall and Mark got over the wall and the lion got down and I'm, I'm feeling this moment, this time of helplessness. The lion seemed to be toying with him. Am I going to try to help him? What could I possibly do? Jump on his back. I had no weapons. And as Mark moved around the corner, his daughter sat on the end of the bench. And I began to prepare myself, trying to find the courage to do what we had to do. And I woke up. <sighs> but I said, Lord, what, what is that about? And immediately, this scripture came to mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And Peter goes on to say, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of be believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And I am reminded that this is not heaven. Even if I am experiencing heaven personally, this is not heaven. Through this, my eyes are open to something much larger, the world. The world Jesus was talking about when, he sent his, when God sent his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. A world full of people. And so this Passion Week, this Holy Week, I want to give you something to think about. So when you've been over every reason you personally can think of to be grateful, realizing he is your personal Savior, and he has forgiven you, forgiven you of all your personal sins, and you try to get your heart and your head around what that, incredible, undeserved, ridiculous thing is. And you still find yourself thinking, like me sometimes, I feel like I should be in more awe of this. More overwhelmed by this event that we celebrate, but I just don't seem to be there sometimes. Consider what James says, that each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed and then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. What I've noticed this week is that when that dragged away, that lured, that enticed, moves beyond your own personal struggle, and becomes, it becomes organized, similar to the way that the Holy Spirit in me and the Holy Spirit in Reed and the Holy Spirit in, in each of you is organized by his spirit. It's orchestrated, right? In a similar way, in the kingdom of darkness, in the spiritual realm, sin and wickedness is organized. I think of what Paul says in Ephesians, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Try for a minute not to think about that in relation to just your own personal struggle or your own life, but in relation to the church, the whole church all over the earth, representing the kingdom of God and also the world, which is under the rule of darkness. The kingdom of darkness. Ephesians 5.8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Colossians 1.13, Paul says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. In Matthew 4, Jesus said that, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to 
preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, if Jesus is the ruler of the light and the Holy Spirit is the coordinator, orchestrated for his purposes, right? Then who is the ruler of darkness? There is one, you know. There are coordinators. Paul tells us in Acts 26, I will deliver you from the Jewish people. He tells us what the Lord told him. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We saw it work. We saw this at work from the moment Jesus came to Jerusalem. And Luke 22 says, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Mark says in his gospel, they sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. In verse 3 in Luke 22, then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. John says it like this, the devil having already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. And it doesn't stop there. It becomes more organized even than that. In Luke 23, Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. And it wasn't Pilate. In this case, it wasn't the ruler of, the, of this earthly realm. But they, the crowd, they shouted, saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. Absolutely organized in the spiritual realm it reminds me uh it got me thinking about these systematic evils in the world and i made a little list here and then i had to stop because it's just too long but here's a few a taste and the thing i love about lists is that about numbers if you get to the point in your life where you can think of them not just as numbers is that these are people I'm going to talk about souls, addiction, drug and alcohol addiction, three million deaths every year result from the harmful use of alcohol and drugs. That's worldwide. These are worldwide numbers. According to the World Health Organization, there are about between 40 and 50 million abortions a year. And of course, there are going to be many other numbers. Pornography estimated a $97 billion industry worldwide. 600,000 plus traders of this stuff in the U.S. alone online. The U.S. is a top consumer of both illegal and obscene types. Human trafficking. The equality fact now, now fact sheet, the world's it is the world's fastest growing crime. 21 million adults and children a year. It is a $100 billion a year industry. These are people. Many helpless. War. There are four major conflicts where 10,000 or more deaths happen each year. War in Afghanistan, the Mexican drug war, the Syrian civil war, the Yemeni crisis. And then there are all kinds of others around the globe. And then 
That's not to mention the 6,000 years that have come before this. A couple worth mentioning. The, world, the Great World War number two, 60 million deaths. The Mongol conquest, 35 million. Three kingdoms war, 38 million. Listen, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I haven't mentioned gang violence, school violence, murder rates, abuses against elders, children, and whatnot, false religions, all for what? Money, power, resulting in what? Every one of them, death. Physical, spiritual, emotional. Listen, and this doesn't even take into account the curse. For example, lack of clean water. Two billion people use a drinking water source contaminated with feces in our world today. Diseases that come with that, contaminated drinking water is estimated to cause 500,000 deaths each year. Starvation, over 9 million people die every year of hunger. These are not necessarily works of rulers of the darkness or hosts of spiritual wickedness or organized efforts on demonic forces. They don't control the weather or who and how many people are born in certain places. Simply the consequence or the byproduct of life under the curse. However, you don't have to look far to see the rulers and authorities and the hosts of darkness at work when you see corrupt governments which maintain and further oppress and exploit these situations instead of helping them. Organized, systematic wickedness. See, in my personal life, things may be okay. They may be good. They may be great. But things are not okay in the world, brothers and sisters. There is a darkness that covers this earth an evil of such magnitude that most of us can't even begin to fathom the severity of it. And so sometimes we say, why even try, right? And at first, you may be tempted to feel like I do when I get to the end of a list like this and like I did in that dream. Helpless. Angry. Afraid, but there is hope. This is not the end of the story. He came once to bring, to bring the kingdom of God near, and he's coming again to bring it in its fullness. Jesus tells his disciples before leaving, John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Paul reminds the church again years later in his second letter to the Thessalonians, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another with these words. It echoes Jesus' words in Matthew 24, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. It's the same prophecy in which Daniel predicted as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed." Hmm. So I think again about those words in Revelation 19. 
about him coming on a white horse in the clouds with judgment and fury in his eyes with an army. Is this exactly meaning literally what it will look like? I don't know. John says, like a lot in his revelation because he just doesn't have words for it. But I have confidence in this, that the result will be just as described. The end of wickedness, of darkness, of evil, of death. The fullness of his kingdom will be established Right? We read on in Revelation, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sadness, no more organized wickedness on the earth. The enemy will no longer be prowling around like a lion looking for those whom he can destroy. In the meantime, in the meantime, right, we have the church. If you didn't hear Pastor Reed's word last week about the greater works that Jesus said we would do, I encourage you, I implore you to go and listen to it. For there is our weapon. There is our way. There is what we do in the meantime. And this is why I love our partnership with Organizations like the Rescue Mission, Pregnancy Help Center, the Voice of the Martyrs, Teen Challenge, and a number of others. Because in the meantime, we do what we can. We push back against the darkness. We bring hope to the oppressed. We bring the kingdom of God near. And so I'm faced with this reality as I consider all this, as I did in that dream. If the time comes, like many of the great martyrs after Jesus ascended, if the time comes that I am asked to lay down my life, what will I do? I won't pretend that that I know in this moment. Lord, help me have the courage. So what I'm going to do is we're going to play a song here. I requested uh, this song from Michelle. It's an old song. And before it plays, I'm going to ask Pastor Reed uh, to blow the shofar. The trumpet, if you don't know, the trumpets that are referred to in Scripture are the ram's horn, the shofar. By the way, he told me that he heard the song on the radio this week and asked it. I did not tell him I had requested the song. The song has not been played in years. And so I encourage you, in the midst of all that I've laid before you today, to see the hope that is coming And as we sing this song, would you join me in this praise?